telling me how logical it was. Some of you actually had highlighters. So, you know, you get brownie points for that. Um, in terms of altered thinking, and um, you're welcome, if, when you do an assessment, you use your own terminology. You might want to put cognitions, any, whatever you like. But the things I had, and this is for you because I didn't talk to you, um, things like, I'm going to die. Something is wrong with my heart. The doctors are wrong. My friends are wrong. So all the thoughts that are, are going through her head that without the situation, so the emergency room presentation, she probably wouldn't be thinking. Um, altered emotions, mood decline, anxious, worried, fear. Altered physical symptoms, you've got palpitation, shortness of breath, sweating, trembling, altered sleep and exhaustion. And then the altered behaviour or activity levels. A good starting point for this one is just to say, what have you stopped doing? And immediately we can see she's not exercising, driving, drinking coffee, foolish lady, because um, it's almost coffee time. Obviously, I need a coffee. Um, social relationships. And she's also had lots of days off work. Now, um, Julian made the point that you know, all of those, what have you stopped doing, could almost be presenting issues too. But, and that's a trap we sometimes, sometimes fall into in terms of we might start chasing one of those to fix that when it's not the issue. It's a side issue and sometimes clients are, are more comfortable addressing the little non-threatening things like I want to start driving again. That will, might be part of the overall therapy but we've still got to, our theory is needs this breakdown. Um, well done, thank you. So what I'd like to do is just to get you to do the formulation and then we'll break for coffee. Is that okay? You can all manage a bit another 15 minutes? Yeah. Okay. So um, we're on to page 12 and there's many ways of doing formulations and sometimes it differs according to the diagnosis of the client. I've picked out probably one of the simpler ones, not because you're... You can't handle anything else, but we've only got three hours. And um, really, we could use three days to go through everything. And you're going, no, <laughs> my summer holiday. So um, we will be just working on, on a very simple formulation, but it will still give you the idea. So um, case formulation is literally um, looking at the theory behind the client's problem and developing almost a hypothesis. So. Um, as it says, psychologically informed explanation of the client's problems. And based on that explanation, we can work out how to approach what to do next. So um, we arrive at an individual's theory of the client's difficulties. And it's shared with the client. That's crucial. So the client has to, be, has to understand what's going on, what's causing what, the relationship so that they're on board when you start the interventions. Um, whenever possible, it's preferable to base a formulation on an actual incident rather than what generally happens when the client gets caught up in the problem. So some ways to approach case formulation, and we'll be looking at the second one because some of you may already be familiar with the five P's model. Yep, some, some, no, yeah. got one too. Yeah. <laughs> That's some. Um, so the first one I've put down, <clears throat> um, you develop a problem list. Um, and that's, that's based on your assessment. So it's not, it's not the client's problem that they presented with. It's the client's difficulties in terms of cognitive, behavioural and emotional components from the assessment. Um, then you look at the hypothesised mechanisms. And that's the physio physiological mechanisms. And that's the physical components that we list, looked at in the assessment. Um, account or narrative of how the um, me hypothesised mechanisms lead to the <coughs> difficulties. Um, current precipitants, events or situations that are activating the client's vulnerability at this time. Origins of the vulnerability, and that's where your client history comes in. Because I know some of you were itching to include um, the mother's depression and suicide. We don't ignore that, but we come, we come to that in the formulation. Uh, treatment plan and obstacles. The other one, which is what um, I'll get you to work on now, 
the five P's approach and we divide the formulation into presenting issues, precipitating factors, perpetuating factors, predisposing factors and protecting factors. And um, the protecting factors can be both positive and negative, so anything that the client does, um, I guess, no, I'll get onto that in a minute. Right? Um, <coughs> so no, on page 13, no matter what the approach you take, you need to check continually to be certain the client understands what you're talking about. A lot of, um, we find that, um, and Beck, what, who started all this at one point, said often patients with depression, for example, will just agree, because it's just easier. Yeah, I understand, yeah, I agree. Um, you have to be really confident that they do understand and they do agree. They're not just complying because they couldn't be bothered arguing because it's just too much hard work. They've come to counselling to be told what to do. Oh yeah, you're telling them what to do. So don't fall into the trap of, you know you don't direct clients. Don't think that this gives you the ability to, to direct clients because they're saying, yes, I agree, yes, I agree. You still have to poke a bit nicely. Um, so I'm going to, <clears throat> and I'll run you through it in a minute, but, um, and, the, and then we'll look at the therapy goals when we've done this. But if you turn over the page, <clears throat> So the very top box, what made me vulnerable in the first place, that's your predisposing factors. And that's where you get to put your client history, anything that's relevant. So we, we're not ignoring it, we just wait for the formulation. Um, <clears throat> the one on the right, triggers for the most recent episode, that's your precipitating factors. And that's that's something that has physically dragged this client into counselling. And um, in this, no, you're going to do that. Um, <clears throat> the presenting problem. Now, that's where you decide what the presenting problem is and ask the client. So in this case, it is along the lines of something like persistent fear of having another attack and dying. Based on everything you did in the assessment, um, would anyone disagree with that or, or word it differently or feel it's different in, a, in different somehow? You can disagree with me. Well, the thing that I'm really struggling with yep. is that another type of modality would focus on the client's mother's suicide rather than the presenting um, panic attacks and that would be the focus and is, is what we're suggesting here is that the problem would be the panic attacks not the, the mother's passing yeah okay yeah so that's because what I disagree with fundamentally yeah oh and, and you're more than welcome to disagree but if you remember way back to the beginning focus on an issue we will get later on the mother will come into it but this person has presented with an issue. Yeah. CBT deals with the presenting issue, a specific issue. Now, <clears throat> after, after we've addressed this presenting issue, the client then has tools to deal with any other issue. She, she might then be sitting with a friend and a friend says, oh, by the way, my mother died. And the client might feel a panic attack <clears throat> triggered by the fact that her mother died. And she now has the tools to deal with that. So you're coming at it from let's go back into the past and work with that issue. CBT... Well, I, I, don't, I think it's a balanced approach between the two, not just a one-sided approach on, on the, the, the present. Um, so it's not just about being psychodynamic and going into the past, but having a balanced approach. Yeah, I yeah. And, and so we have brought this predisposing into the formulation. Mm. But <clears throat> it is... It's, yeah, it's a struggle. Look, um, and thank you so much for saying that because I'm guessing a lot of you are sitting there going, um, she's so clinical. Is anyone thinking that? No, not necessarily. <laughs> I think I, when I first started, my, before I was doing counselling as a job, um, I actually felt exactly the same way. But then I realised that um, with a lot of, because I worked with a few people who had eating disorders and when I 
realise that first you have to deal with the behaviour, the problem, and then once that was kind of under control, then we could do go back, and then we could do more psychotherapy, yeah. and psychotherapy yeah. stuff, and then that helped in the long run. But first, we had to deal with like this behaviour that was killing her and really yeah. disrupting yeah. her everyday life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and if you were to say to the client, look. I think I want, <clears throat> we need to talk about your mother. She would probably scratch your eyes out and say, don't be ridiculous, I came here because I'm dying and the doctors won't believe me. Mm -hmm. So, and then you've only, you might only have six or 12 sessions and you have to weigh up now, am I going to forcibly make this woman talk about her mother or are we going to work um, with the presenting issue and give her tools? So, but thank you, I like disagreeing. <laughs> Mate, it actually makes people talk. Yay. I'm seeing more and more the value of CBT in oh, thank equipping, you. in equipping the person <laughs> or the client that you're working with mm -hmm. to deal with their own issues. Yeah. But I guess the question then is that once you have had these six to twelve sessions with your client and you've opened them up and she might be more insightful than she is and a little bit more vulnerable or aware of underlying issues, mm -hmm. what then happens after the twelve sessions that the that will patient. completely depend on the agency you're working in, um, what follow-up procedures they have, and that I can't answer. In my ideal world, um, I would I would recommend, yep, yeah, work with the presenting issue, make a person comfortable, and then offer them another, if they need it, another 12 sessions to, to use a different modality, narrative therapy, <coughs> emotion focused therapy, any of those. So there's nothing within the CBT model that you can do in those 6 to 12 sessions that will actually equip the client to further deal with the um, you're, you're giving them, You're giving them tools to in dispute in their own mind when thoughts become distressing. Right. Now if, if the thoughts about the mother, the mother's suicide become distressing, ideally the client has tools either to deal with it or to recognise that she's slipping back and to seek further help. Right. So, so it's not uh, all-encompassing. It's you know, it's it's, a, it's um as way back at the very start, it was you know, it's problem-focused, present-focused, problem-focused. Um, so it's a great entry point, but it's obviously something that will uncover things and and you know offer the client greater self-awareness so they can see what yeah. else is going on underneath. Okay. Yeah. Look, we don't exist in an ideal world. Um, in an ideal world, um, people could have unlimited access to um, mental health, anything if they needed it. It doesn't happen. So we work with what we've got. Okay. But totally see your point. <laughs> And you are still disagreeing. Oh, no, not at all. Oh, oh, really? No, no, no I, 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 I think we all agree that a balanced approach is... Yeah. is oh, look, I agree. <laughs> and, and look, I don't think I disagree at all. Look, where, where I work at the moment, because I'm full-time teaching, um, but I still keep my counselling up as I do pro bono counselling in an agency, and that gives me the freedom to see a person as long as I like mm. and do whatever, do whatever I like with them, but to continue working. When I was working... Um, as opposed to teaching, I was limited to those sessions and it creates an ethical dilemma in your head. You know you're sending people out who aren't quite ready. Um, that's, and that's, that's hard to get your head around. So you work with what you've got, what you can give them. Some places are only offer three or four sessions. No, it's, um, money's tight in mental health. But um, where you're going, I think they're all six to 12 sessions. Look, we'll do this formulation and then have a break, okay? But thank you. Keep disagreeing with me. It no. livens things up. <laughs> I know you're listening too then. Could you use CBT for a more underlying issue? So, for example, this, this girl's anxiety actually does stem from her mother's death. And that's being triggered by external factors in her life situation. Look, um, if you... If you went down that road, you might be looking at, she may have um, under, what, underlying assumptions that she should have been, you know, she should have protected her mother. Maybe she's got this yeah. perception that she should protect everyone. Um, so, yeah, you can use it in those, in areas like that. Because we often find that if someone dies, um, there's lots of grief. But there's also 
can be lots of guilt that, you know, why didn't I, why didn't I do more? And that, that is underpinned by the fact that I should be all to everyone. Um, I, you know, I should have single-handedly saved this person's life. So, yes, yeah. you can. So, yeah, depending on the individual and what they respond to. But what I've tried to give you is a fairly simple, you know, straightforward example because we're, you don't have a lot of time. Okay. Um, so, yeah, things that keep the problem going. Um, they're the per perpetuating um, issues and um, you'll find there's quite a few of those. And then finally, protecting. And usually one of the, the key things of protecting factors that you put top of the list, sought help from you because they're sitting in front of you. So ready to get help. I mean, admit, in this case, she had a panic attack in the middle of the night and it pushed her into seeking help, but she's there. So that is number one protecting factor. Have a go at that for five, five or so minutes and then we'll have a quick break. Just on our own. Um, look, work with us. Work with the same person if, as long as you got on okay. Because <laughs> um, it's, it's probably a lot faster and a lot um, and, and validates a lot more if you're with someone.